Yes, everybody. Hello and welcome to another episode of Fire Builders Live. My name is Josh Corporal. I am streaming live from Key West, Florida. And today I have very, very important and special guest Jennifer Miller on the show. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Welcome to Fire Builders Live. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and I'm ready to have this conversation. Same with me. I feel like I've been ready for a while now. Uh, and, uh, and to be honest, if you, well, for everybody that's watching right now that's unfamiliar with how Fire Builders Live works, what we do is we bring on experts, we take big goals, big ideas, big concepts, and we break them down into small things, small steps that you can do consistently to improve. And today is an incredibly, incredibly important conversation to have because of our social climate, because of the way things are in today's world, right? We're going to be talking about inclusion and diversity and having the conversations sometimes difficult that, uh, you know, that we all want to have, but just some, you know, really don't necessarily know how to start or finish. Uh, and so that's why I'm so excited to have Jen on the show today because she's a woman of color. She's the daughter of two law enforcement officers. You're the wife of a local pastor. You lead a a women's Bible study. You're the the mother of seven children, including foster children, and yes. you're the ex and you're the executive director of JSM Diversity, which is an amazing an amazing uh, just just business and consultancy, um, helping these these companies foster equal opportunities for women, for people of color, for at risk youth, and and just recently, like as of what like a week week and a half ago, you led Hendersonville Tennessee. Just a week, uh, Hendersonville, yeah. Tennessee's first ever Peace Walk, which was an enormous success. So again, I'm so happy to have you on the show. Thanks for being on here and welcome to Fire Builders Live. Absolutely, thank you so much uh, for having me today and allowing me to speak into this very relevant topic right now and um, be able to share some guidance and some some insight on how to have these conversations in a de-escalated format and just how to get people more comfortable talking about things that are uncomfortable. So I appreciate being here. I, uh, I so appreciate you as well. And I, you know, I totally agree. In fact, I think you know, just to kick things off, maybe, maybe something that people listening are thinking about right now is, is how do I even start? And I, you know, I felt, I have felt that way too. I've, had anxiety with regards to what I was going to say and how I say it and whether or not it would be misconstrued and, and whether it would be accepted or rejected. And there's, so there's a lot of anxiety around that whole thing. How do you even suggest that people start having this type of talk with one another? Um, I think that you've got to acknowledge that people are on a spectrum when it comes to this kind of conversation, that not everybody is ready to just jump into dialoguing about um, law enforcement using lethal force against black people or the black community. Um, not everybody's ready to jump into a conversation about allyship and not every uh, African-American person wants an ally right now. Some people are just angry and frustrated. So I think most importantly, if you're wanting to have this kind of conversation, the first thing that you need to be aware of is your audience, like who you're talking to, where they fall right now. Are they someone who is in a position that they are ready to have a conversation. Um, have you just taken some time to listen to their thought processes so that you could analyze if they're ready to have that kind of conversation? So I always encourage like community members and friends and anyone that is interested in, in dialoguing about race relations in America to first be aware of uh, their audience. And in order to do that, you're going to have to start by listening. Yeah, I agree. Like listening is the key. What, what kind of what are you listening for? Are you listening for like verbal verbal cues that yeah you know I'm I'm ready to talk I'm I'm ready to to be heard. Uh, is it more? Is it more? Hey man, just like just just quiet down and listen for the time being and see where the conversation evolves. Um, what do you well, think? Well, I think I think that you're listening for some very key things. So, and speaking about that spectrum, I like to tell clients and and friends that people right now are falling on. Um, kind of like a three point spectrum. So you have some people who are just very frustrated, and angry about what's going on, and they are going to be spewing some rhetoric. Um, and then you've also got some people who are past the anger and they're at a point where they want to talk about policy. They want to talk about reform. 
And then you've got some people who have just decided that there's not really anything to talk about. Like, this is not a problem. This is this is not something that is statistically relevant. This is something that the media is blowing out of proportion. Um, these aren't real things that are happening. And so I think that that is probably where you need to start if you're going to start having these conversations. Like identify which type of person you're talking about. Absolutely. And so as you're listening, when people are giving you feedback on this, someone who is not about allyship is just going to be very angry and they're going to be very frustrated. Now, that doesn't mean they can't grow to a place of being able to have that conversation. That just means right now they are in a position where they are willing to talk. They've been directly impacted, hurt by this. They're frustrated. And in the same way in a relationship, you don't get anything resolved when you're in the height of that anger. You got to wait kind of till things calm down so you can have that talk. I think that the same thing is applicable when you're talking about things that have affected an entire community of people. Um, you got to kind of let that let that dissipate. So maybe they're just looking for someone to listen to their frustration. And that's not going to be the time that you're going to want to delve into a very deep conversation about race relations. Right. But if you're having a conversation like the one we're having right now, or maybe you have a neighbor and you're curious about their perspective on what's happening, or maybe you go to church with someone or whatever, whatever um, area of life that you intersect with a person of color that you may want to find out what their experiences are like, um, then that may be a more appropriate setting. And so you're listening for body, you're listening for their tone, you're watching their body language, you're listening for key words that they're going to use that are going to give you a little bit more of an idea of what part of this spectrum they fall on. And so you know how to approach that conversation. You know, it's, it's, it's very interesting because, um, because if you do identify with somebody or you identify that you're, you're speaking with somebody that's ready to talk and ready to have a conversation like we are right now, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I'm not always sure that I am going to be able, like I want to try and listen and I want to try and relate. But of course, my experience have been vastly different in my life as to, you know, others and what they've experienced. And, and I feel like my natural tendency is to try and say, oh, I, I completely relate to that. I can understand where you're coming from as if I would, you know, any, anything like this, but that's not, I, I almost don't feel like that's really the way to go because it's, it's, disingenuous and sometimes I have no idea what you know it is that you're going through so how like how do I handle that or how does anyone handle that um I think that that is probably the most ready question that I'm asked more often than any other is how do I have a conversation about something that I have no experience no I can't relate to this I can't say I understand how that feels um and I think that that's the first part is just being able to understand that your experience your thought processes are going to be different. And I think where I'm coming into a lot of, um, I'm coming into a snag and a lot of conflict with white, the white community that, that I'm speaking to is that they don't have thought processes that identify and that, um, that display bias because of someone's race. And so they assume that everybody else is like that too. And I think that that, can misguide and that can misconstrue the enormity of what's happening right now. Like, you're not a racist person and you don't because of the color of their skin does not mean that everyone that looks like you feels the same way. And so I think that the first thing that you have to do is acknowledge that your experiences are not going to be able to directly relate to the people that you're speaking to. And I think that the second point to acknowledge is that your experiences don't represent the entire the people who are experiencing racism from people that look like you. And so I think it's naive for people to approach a conversation and their thought process be, oh, well, I don't think like this. So certainly Joe down the street doesn't think like this. And I've had an experience and an encounter with Joe that is completely different. And I'm like, yeah, actually Joe does think like that. And um, it's almost like trying to convince people that your experiences are real. And that is what the frustration is from the black community right now. When you're trying to talk to somebody about race and you're trying to talk to them about racial profiling, you're trying to talk to them about barriers, you're trying to talk to them about constantly seeing visual reminders of slavery and of pain and human trafficking. And they're telling you that, well, the data doesn't support that. It, it's painful. It's a painful point for professionals. It's a painful point for athletes. It's a painful point for 
everyday people to know that they and their family members have been at the brunt end of racism and prejudice and, and to not be able to have a document that supports that and not be able to prove that statistically. And so you just say, well, it didn't happen. That's not real. It's almost like a trauma victim being told that that rape didn't happen. It is yeah. constantly reliving this idea that what I've experienced in my life, what my children have experienced, what my husband has experienced is just, it's not, it's not a real thing because there's no data to support it. When people like, when you get your feelings invalidated, if you're in a relationship and you're just, and you try and tell the person how you feel and they say, no, I don't, I don't think that you feel that way. Like you just, right. And it's just, you're stuck because you say that, look, this is real, but there's no way that I can prove it to you at this point. I mean, so where, so if you're dealing with somebody like that, um, if, if you're dealing with that type of situation, what's the next step forward? How do you like, I don't know, how do you um, further the conversation at that point? Well, one thing an advisor once told me in, in this line of work that I do and having these conversations on very public and private platforms on a daily basis. I'm sure some of the people that I've had these conversations with is watching right now or are watching right now. Um, the first thing that you have to know is that people have to be ready for it. It's like it's got to be ready soil. You are not going to, in one conversation, convince someone who is very strong on their beliefs that racism is not a problem in America. I often start my conversations by letting them know, like, listen, if you are here today and you are waiting for me to say some magic thing that is going to convince you that this is a real issue in America, you might as well get on up and leave because there's nothing that Jen is going to tell you to convince you that this is real. So I think for me and the conversations that I'm having, I'm making sure that this is a person who is just needing a little bit more information. This is a person that is needing to have a dialogue. And this is not someone that is waiting to have an argument or waiting to have a debate because I can't debate you based on my experience. That's something that I'm living and that's something that is real. And I can't debate you based on other people's experience. But where I can relate to you on is basic human rights. I can talk to you about law enforcement and I can talk to you about procedures. I can talk to you about implicit bias versus racism. Those are things that we can have a conversation about and we can even have a debate about those things and perception. But the intrinsic human right of an individual to be treated equal, I can't convince you of that. Yeah. And there's nothing. I mean, you could go to 100 talks and it's it's almost as if you would have to dig so far deep into that person's psyche to find out where those, you know, where those thoughts and feelings are coming from. And how are you able how are you possibly going to do that in such a short amount? Right. of time? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. They've got to come ready to. I mean, and, and anyone that's coming to you more likely, I'll say this more often than not, is ready to have this conversation. Like they're not going to approach you with a closed mind. Um, they are going to come to you wanting to wanted to explore that. And I think for people in the black community, when you're having an opportunity to have these conversations, realize that in this moment, you can be the teacher like you're able to share an experience that's representative of your entire race and you can shift the thought process of someone who just may not be aware of what these experiences are like. And so I always encourage people, please have these dialogues, like have a talk with anybody that wants to have a talk. If someone calls me at four o'clock in the morning and they want to make a post about equality and they ask me, can they say black or African-American? I'm down for it. Like I'm going to answer that question just because I want to create and I want to foster safe spaces for conversation. I want to foster safe spaces to ask, hey, how do you get your hair like that? I want to foster safe places for people to ask things that they don't and because really at the root of racism is fear of the unknown. And so when people are afraid of what they don't know and they don't have the right place to ask those questions, then this fear just perpetuates into extreme action. And that action comes out in our bias and then that bias transitions into racism. The, the even questions like uh, even questions like that, like like you mentioned, like, how do you get your hair that way? Um, you know, I've had that question asked to me, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> well, and I'm sure that it comes from a place of pure curiosity. There's no right. judgment behind it. There's nothing, you know, negative about it. It's like, I'm no. legitimately curious how you did that. Yeah, absolutely. I don't, and I think that there's a level of sensitivity that has to be removed from it because I mean, I think it's great that we're in a place that we're actually having dialogues as simple as how did you get your hair like that? Or how come it's not statistically proven that racism is an issue for the black community and law enforcement? I think these are great questions wherever they fall. 
Um, and I think that you do have to have a level, a sense of humor um, at some point. And I do think that you've got to have a tolerance to be able to have these conversations in a de-escalated format. Um, three of our core competencies for JSM diversity are consistency, composure, and compassion. And if you can't stay composed in the face of someone who has a different opinion, they've got a different education, they've got a different environment that they've grown up in, then um, you know, you're not going to be in the right place to have this kind of dialogue. Yeah. I mean, it's just going to, I feel like it'll spiral off into something emotional and then there's no progress made at that point at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, definitely. And I've seen that happen time and time again. So these, these dialogues are better had in smaller settings where people can ask questions and they're comfortable to ask those questions. I think when you've got a public forum and a public platform, people are listening, but they're also thinking things in their mind that they're not able to ask. It's kind of like when you sit in church, right? And this pastor's given this great sermon, but you kind of are like, well, I don't know if I agree with that part or, but you can't ask that because you're in a public setting. And so we need to foster more small group conversations um, that are able to, to happen in, you know, a more safe environment for people to have disagreements and for people to, to have conversation about, about the issues that are happening. The, you know, you mentioned previously, like the implicit bias and the law enforcement um, police officers. I mean, being the daughter of, of law enforcement officers, you're in a very unique position uh, mm -hmm. to, to see a lot of the sides of all of this. What is it that makes this issue so complex and difficult to talk about? So that's a loaded question. Wow. Um, there are many things that makes this, that makes this such a, a difficult conversation to have and that makes it so complex. But I'll, I'll share with you some of the things that are more readily identifiable. I think number one, law enforcement just does not have a very strong relationship with the black community. And I think that it's for the, the very reason that anybody doesn't have a strong relationship. There's no communication. There's no, no dialogue. Um, the community is not meeting enough with police officers and police chiefs. And so we kind of just stopped talking for so long that now we're all just making assumptions about what the reasons are that other people are doing things. I met with our local law enforcement um, community uh, relations officer yesterday, and we had like a two hour conversation that was absolutely great. As the daughter I've had these conversations my whole life about what protocol is and what procedure is. And so I recognize in a lot of these incidents that this is a this is an implicit bias issue. It's not a racism issue. Um, when you talk about the Philando Castile situation and you talk about this officer who fired into a vehicle with a child in the vehicle, with um, another civilian in the vehicle. And after he had asked for this civilian to perform a, uh, to um, perform an action, he asked him to get his ID out. Well, in the process. Happened in Philando Castile informed the officer that he had a, um, a license to carry a weapon, which the weapon was in the vehicle. Well, this particular officer, based on his upbringing, his environment, his experience, his education, based on the music that he listens to, the videos that he watched, the people that he regularly arrests that may look exactly like Philando Castile, all of these neurons are firing in his head at the same time. And that bias made him think and see in his mind that this person was a threat to his life. And so he fired into a vehicle. He ignored all of his, his protocol. He ignored everything that he knows about how he's been trained to handle these situations. And that one statement just, it played into his bias. And so if you were to ask me if, if he's racist, I don't think that he's racist. I don't know him personally to be able to say that. And I don't know about his history, but I can say based on what I observed and what was displayed, what was Facebook Live from what happened, that was a bias issue. And so when you're talking about bias, that is, that's a much different issue um, than racism. And so with a lot of these police officers who are using lethal force, it has more bias and it has more to do with being able to identify bias in themselves than it has to do with racism. And I know that that's not a widely accepted view from many people in the black community, but to your point, I was raised by cops, so I understand procedure and I understand protocol. I understand that on the alpha shift, which is the, your 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift, 
if one cop pulls you over to have to show up because it's the night shift. And whenever that happens, you've got to have more people there just in case something goes wrong. But I also know that based on where we are in the country, when you're driving by and you see three cops pull over one young black teenager for speeding or, you know, whatever they pulled them over dark tents, it may come off as though now he's being, you know, he's being bullied or he's being profiled. And I think that again, that's a communication issue because it's an easy thing to have a community forum where law enforcement says, Hey, listen, if you see three cops behind one vehicle, no matter who that passenger is, and it's at night, that's our protocol. It's not because we said, oh, it's a black guy. Let's bring three people behind us. And so I think there has to be more conversation and more understanding of what police protocol is and what it is not. And I also think there has to be understanding and there has to be some training provided for police officers to be able to identify their own implicit bias because they do arrest the same people every single day. And they might look like people who aren't committing any crimes at all. And so it's important for them to be able to identify and recognize that. Well, and when you talk about that and you talk about implicit bias, but for those that are listening right now, if you're, maybe they might be a little bit unfamiliar with what you actually mean. I mean, I think what you mean is everything that they have known, have thought of, right, their experiences, et cetera, right, lead them to interpret a con like a situation in one way versus another. And, uh, and what you're saying is, is that like for that police officer that shot into the car, even though that gentleman had like a license to carry, right, mm -hmm. that was not necessarily, it had nothing to do with what you're trained to do, that it had more to do with, with how he thought and felt at the time, right, personally, subjectively. Absolutely. So when you talk about implicit bias, you just talk about the way that your brain is wired to think things. And that's based on your environment that you grew up in, based on your experiences that you've had, and that's based on your level of education. And so any one of those three things can have an effect or all three of those things have an effect on the way that you see the world, your worldview, who's who's dangerous, who's not. If you grew up in a home that had trauma because, um, you know, there was abuse by a, a, a mom, let's say, and, and she's a white female. So you and your life may have issues with white females based on the fact that your mother was abusive and this was a person that caused a lot of pain and anguish in your life. And so it doesn't change just because you get a job and it doesn't change because you get a badge and a gun. Like these are things that still play a role in the way that you you see the world. It was a test that was done um, and, and a study that I was in a while back where the, the guest speaker came out and she asked us and she said, well, I want you guys to close your eyes for a moment. I just want you to, to think about what I'm saying. And so she said, well, I am on a trip or let's say you are on a trip and you are getting ready to fly to New York and you get on, you're running through the airport and the pilot opens the door right before it was about to close and says, you finally made it and you smile and then you have a seat and you sit next to someone who's ha who's a doctor and they're having a great conversation with you. Then you land the plane, you go to your favorite restaurant and the waiter was just over beyond nice and gave you an extra appetizer. Then you show up to the event and the CEO comes out and they give this grand speech and they acknowledge you and your contribution to the company. And she told us to open our eyes and she said, okay, now, was the black, was the pilot black? Was the person that you sit, sat next to on the plane, the doctor, was that someone from India? Was the waitress that waited on you a older white female? And was the CEO that came out a young black woman? And so, of course, we think about our own experiences. And I'm checking these boxes in my head. I'm like, no, the pilot was a white man and the doctor was, you know, a white lady and whatever my experiences are, it's going to shape that story very differently. And so for the people who are viewing and for you, even Josh, I'm sure that in your mind, as you're, you're identifying these people, they all look different. And so that is how that's, that's called implicit bias. That's something that internally we think through. Could that, could it have been a black male pilot? Of course it could have. Is that what we regularly see? No, it's not. And so our bias plays into where we've come up, what experiences that we've had, they create these neurological pathways that are just repetitive in our minds. So we don't even think about who could be a doctor or who could, or who should be a police officer. It just goes based on what we've seen. And in this yeah. day and age where what we've seen is like a movie TV, 
you know, music that we've listened to, like all of these things play a role in how we behave daily towards one another. You know, that's that's interesting because as you were as you were saying that, you know, none of I'm honestly for personally, none of the people that you mentioned were black, like in my head. I mean, it just wasn't. And you're right. Like, it's just because of my experiences and, and what I've grown up with. Right. I see this like the CEO is an old crust, like an old white guy, like <laughs> Warren Buffett looking guy, you know, kind right. of thing. Right? And, right. and it wasn't like a young sort of Silicon Valley CEO or anything. Right. So, so anyway, so I, I completely agree. And that's a great way to understand what you're talking about. I, uh, I want to go back because somebody just put something in the comments. And I think it's because we're having this open dialogue. I think it's important to bring it up and uh, and ask. Right. Her, sure. you know. So she said, you know, that officer in the Castillo case was racist. He had the power over life and death and his prejudices allowed him to kill an innocent person, which is racist. And what I, and I'd like to give you maybe a chance to respond, because I, I know that what you're trying to say is that it's those prejudices. It's that inherent bias that that caused the shooting, not necessarily being racist. There's a difference between those two. So what do you think? Yeah, I think that we as a society, we interchange words a lot, right? So you talk about the Peace Walk and, you, and what I was trying to do in Hendersonville and what I was what I successfully did in Hendersonville. Just prior to that coming out, there was so much of an uproar in my community about this Peace Walk. It was a peaceful demonstration. It was very um explicitly stated that this was going to be a peace walk, that it was not a protest, that it was not about defunding police officers. But there were still some people who interchanged the word peace walk with protest, with looting, with rioting. And so words become extremely important when you're talking about the issues that are happening right now, because people are hypersensitive to those words. And so when you talk about the definition of racism and how you define racism and how you define what racism is, Based on your own personal definition or what you acknowledge as the definition of racism, someone's showing prejudice to someone else's group based on their skin color, based on their culture, their ethnicity, um, choosing to uh, allow barriers and their bias on based on their skin color to not allow them to have a job or not allow them to um, have human rights that we're all entitled to. That's very different than talking about implicit bias, because bias is something that we all have. In order to be racist, you, you've got to have power. You can't be a racist person if you don't have the power to be racist. Now, an African and a black person be racist? Absolutely, because there are more black people in Africa than there are white people. But in America, I would argue that it would be difficult for a black person to be racist because they don't have they don't have the dominant power, but it is easy for a black person to be prejudiced and to be biased. They can allow their experiences to shape outcomes. And in this particular situ situation that um, Anaya is referring to, I would argue that this officer was not racist, that he was biased based on what I understand about law enforcement and protocol based on his response after he shot Philando Castile and his distraught demeanor. Someone who is racist is not going to feel bad about what they did if they killed someone. Someone who was racist is not going to say, and I quote, why did you make me do that? Someone who is racist is not going to approach that situation with any remorse of what was done. He was absolutely frantic and distraught and disturbed by his actions specifically because Philando was literally pulling out a wallet. They had to remove him from that area because he was out of control. And so when I look at that situation through the lens of a police officer's daughter, a black woman and a civilian and a community member, I don't see a racist person there. I see someone who was subject to not being trained properly with their implicit bias and who had a weapon and used lethal force unnecessarily because of it. Do I think that he still deserves um, to be prosecuted through the law because of that? Absolutely, because you've got a badge and a gun and then it's your responsibility to make sure that you're able to be psychologically capable of identifying this bias. But when you talk about reformation for police departments and you talk about reformation for people who are licensed to kill, I think that this should be mandated that they have this kind of training so that we aren't making um, we aren't making mistakes in calling racism and bias the same thing. If you are able to have implicit bias training, then you are more easily ready, ready to identify people who are racist. And I do think that there are racist cops out there. But I think that a large part of the incidents that have made it 
um, that have made it to television and have made it to media and have been circulating socially have to do with implicit bias and not direct racism. Now, if you're talking about um, George Floyd, I think that that's something different altogether. I think that that's somebody who was psychologically incapable and should not have been a police officer. Like you, there was, there, it was more of a power struggle there with him wanting to be in control. And I do think that based on his history and how many times he had been reprimanded for racially profiling and how many reports were filed on him that he had a, a racist motive in what he was doing. But I would not say the same thing about every single incident. And I think that they have got to be um, looked at and isolated. If you did that, you would find that more of these cops are behaving based on what they do, who they arrest every single day, um, what they've seen, what they've been trained on and what they know versus a hate for have brown skin. Again, clearly I'm not stating that there are not police officers out there who are just hateful people who are their badge to intimidate black people. I, I'm not saying that. I know that that's real. But what I am saying is that implicit bias plays a role in how we, when we get into heightened situations. Yeah, it makes sense. And it's almost as if, it's almost as if like, a, and I, I'm trying to understand this and articulate it as best as I can, but like the, the difference between implicit bias and racism is that it's racism ends up being discrimination, active discrimination, as opposed to like almost subconscious discrimination, right. you know, like you right. have to actively try to be discriminatory and that, that bridges you onto the side of racism as opposed to the implicit bias, which is just, which is almost like the way that you've now been programmed almost. Yeah, I would even call it unconscious bias, right? Because we yeah. don't even, nine times out of 10, we don't even know that we're doing it. We haven't even had the conversations internally or externally to talk about how we grew up, what stories we heard from grandpa about what black people do and didn't do. And um, so those things all play a role in what kind of adults we turn out to be. I mean, just think about having an idea about a group of people and then having a college experience where everybody's kind of thrown in there together or having a work experience where everybody's thrown in there together. And for the first time you realize that what grandpa Joe told you about a whole group of people is just not true and it's not right. And so that's like that unconscious bias coming to light. And that doesn't happen enough outside of our college experiences. Like it just doesn't happen enough where we're able to understand that there are people who had really good intentions in our life that were misguided, uneducated, or even racist that played a role into the thought processes that we have about whole groups of people without ever rubbing shoulders with them. Yeah, exactly. And like, uh, and before we go any further, cause, uh, I want to put this up too, because I think this is an interesting thing. Um, I'm of the school of thought that hatred is rooted in fear. The fear of the unknown connects us in humanity. When someone does not have knowledge and understanding of a person, that will create fertile ground for fear to be planted and produce ill intentions. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. I think that at the base root of racism is this fear of the unknown, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, being afraid to engage, being afraid of rejection, being afraid of, you know, some sort of threat of violence based on just watching movies, you know, or listening to music that have impacted your, your worldview on what's safe and what's not safe. And this can happen with black people and black people. I know black people that have gone through black neighborhoods mm -hmm. of a, um, of a highway. And so I think, or, or, or driven on the other end of a highway. So I do think that we are all subject to that, that fear. And that's something that we have got to, we've got to examine, like, what am I afraid of? And how is that, that fear shaping what I'm doing? And how is that fear shaping the decisions that I'm making? Well, that is a perfect segue into the first question that I like to ask guests on the show, which is, you know, what, what is the first step towards recognizing that within yourself? Um, so for instance, if you would suggest, you know, one thing that somebody does to better get in touch with that fear or to, you know, to start those conversations, start recognizing their own implicit bias, what would you suggest that they do? The first thing that I would suggest that people do is do something hard every day. Have a difficult conversation about this every single day. Um, 
talk to someone that you haven't talked to because you think you know what their thought process is. Have a conversation with a family member or a friend who has given you enough content where you believe you do know what their thought process is and have a tough conversation single day and to the point where tough conversations aren't hard anymore. And you're able to have a dialogue about this and be able to speak for, speak to this from a point of understanding. So I think you've got to have one tough conversation every day until it's not tough anymore and have the kind of conversation that you and I are having right now. Yeah, right. It's almost as if you're, you're, you're kind of building up your confidence to be able to speak your mind, to be able to talk about some of these issues that previously were off the record or taboo, or you weren't exactly sure how people were going to react. You didn't want to agitate anybody or offend them, um, especially in today's like, you know, kind of cancel culture world, right? right? You say one wrong right. thing and you're screwed. And you're out um, of there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, so I think that's, I think that's really good because those conversations consistently help you to build up your confidence in speaking to people about this and, uh, and, and just help with your understanding. And actually that's, that's a perfect lead in to this next, if, if someone were to say, have one of those conversations every single day for say 30 days, right? Really try and put an effort in kind of, if you can, in your experience, paint a picture of where they would end up. How, how would that change the way that they communicate now with, and, and have these types of like non-escalated conversations? I think that they would end up being a more educated and confident, informed um, contribution to society. I think that they'd be able to have this dialogue that could possibly save someone's life. It could save someone's job. It could save someone from experience and bias and intimidation. We as the people, have so much power to impact what's happening right now. We have the power to stand up at our dinner table and say, hey, this conversation is actually racist and we shouldn't be having it. We have the power to say, well, how come Jane didn't get that job and John did and she's equally qualified? We have the power to, to stand on the side of the road and take out a phone and say, hey, you're using excessive force. This person already is in cuffs. I'm going to call dispatch and let them know that you're not behaving in protocol. We have the power to go to our local police stations and ask, do you all have implicit bias training? I want to know because my son is an African-American male and I want to make sure that if he is pulled over for any reason, right or wrong, that none of your guys' bias is going to be what happens in this scenario. So I think that if you're doing this consistently for 30 days, that you're having educated, informed, and safe conversations to ask questions, that you are going to be enlightened as an individual as of other people. I think that you'll have a, a level of understanding, but I also think that you will be able to produce what activism looks like for you and what it looks like to be an ally for you and how you can be a part of a solution. So for me, having these conversations led me into creating a peace walk in my community because I felt that it would be a appropriate for us to stand together as one nation against racism instead of us standing against police or instead of us standing against all these other entities that are being affected by racism for us to say no this is something that everybody should be against and that's an idea that my whole community could get behind and so those things come out of 30 days 60 days and four years of doing this and having these kinds of conversations you you get people coming together you get people listening to your ideas I'm able to speak into so many different organizations, so many different government entities, because I've had these conversations for so long. It's like, if you want to be heard, then be willing to listen. If you want to be heard, be willing to have this kind of dialogue on a regular basis. And people are going to hear your ideas and how things could be better. Yeah. And I, and I love the idea of like the constant repetition, the you know, choosing the right person to have these conversations with is probably also fairly important because, yeah, you know, absolutely. you don't, you, uh, and you're going to get better at identifying, I think, who that person is if you, if you continually try and test and, and, and do it in, and, you know, approach people in a respectful, respectful way. Uh, oh, yeah. one, and one of the things I want to bring up uh, that, that just came up, you know, Ali said there is a major need for more education on the unconscious bias. It is easy for someone to immediately snap to, I'm not racist, and they may not be lying, but everyone has this underlying bias that they're not even aware of. Yeah, 
Absolutely. I would completely agree with that. I think that this is something that um, has just been re recently discussed more readily in professional environments. But I mean, Josh, you and I, we have a microphone, but there are people that hold guns for a living. Like this should definitely be a part of what they're doing. Like I, I can't hurt anyone directly with my microphone, but um, you know, with a weapon, you have the ability to use lethal force. And if you haven't examined where your biases lie, if that's not a part of your hiring process, then that's how we get these constant and happening over and over and over and over again. And let me say this, because I've had conversations with police officers recently who've brought up a great point. And they're like, Jen, you know, I get what you're saying. I totally understand that. I know that bias plays a role. But if 99% of the time you arrest a car burglar and they are a young black male, and this one time there's a, a young black male riding in this neighborhood who is not committing a crime and I behave or other officers behave that way. Um, like it's just so hard is what he was saying to not immediately assume that this person is a, crim a criminal. And as a, as a person, I understand that. Like if every time that I've been abused, it's been by uh, an older black man. I am going to have an apprehension when it comes to older black men. But I think that that's even more of a reason why we have got to have this bias because that one person still matters. And that one person that isn't committing a crime could be your brother, my brother, my son, my husband. And it's not fair for them to have to pay for what other people that look like them have done. And so we've got to stop generalizing people based on their skin color. And we've got to start looking at this as a case by case scenario. And we've got to fight against our neurological pathways that make us want to believe that because 99 people did it this way, 100 people will. 1% is still important. Like it, it just befuddles me that people look at percentiles and they're like, well, it's only 1% of people that are being affected by this. Yeah, but that 1% of people is 100% of a person to someone. They mean everything to someone. And so we have to fight really hard to not do the easy thing and say, well, it's just one out of a hundred times. That one out of a hundred matters because if that one was you or someone that you loved, you would want people to fight just as hard. And I think a lot of the black community is screaming this right now. And they're saying, hey, listen, I know that these incidents may statistically show up as rare, but it still matters to us. We're already a minority uh, race in this country and we're dying at a majority rate, whether that is for violence within the community or without, it's irrelevant. Crime is crime is crime and death is death is death and violence is violence is violence. And particularly when you are trying to equate violence at the hands of law enforcement with violence at the hands of people in their own communities, those people in their own communities have not taken an, oath, taken an oath to serve and protect. You have. And so you have a greater responsibility to make sure that you have put training, that you have put um, implicit bias on the agenda to make sure that, that these incidents don't keep tearing our country apart. It's like, uh, like you said, I mean, if you have that responsibility as a police officer and you know that, say, 99 times where you pull someone over and they're like a young black male and it's, and it's problematic, right, that that implicit bias happens, then it's shifting you over to a more discriminatory state. It's up to you. It's almost your responsibility to pull yourself back to the middle with, Absolutely. with these kinds of dialogues and these kinds of conversations. My goal in leaving any law enforcement agency is to make them remember the conversation that I'm having with them. And so we have a campaign. It's called the Just One Campaign. And it is about that. Like, I want you to remember this just one because that one might be Jen's son. And I don't want my son to be a hashtag. I don't want my husband to be a hashtag. I don't want anybody to be a hashtag. I, I know that although all this George, the George Floyd death has allowed for a lot of conversation to happen, I'm sure that his family members would rather have him there. Um, the recent story that I've learned about with Elijah McClain, who was a young man who was an introvert and he had just um, social disabilities, like his interaction with people was off. And the way that this young man died because he was walking in Colorado with an open face ski mask at a time of night where he was reported to be suspicious, which he absolutely was suspicious, but 
their bias, those officers bias did not allow them to take a pause for a moment and to listen to what he was saying and to think, is this is this the kind of person that we usually arrest here? Let's examine this. Let's check his ID. He says he lives here. And, you know, it, it ended in this young man's life being lost. And now we're talking about his memory and we're talking about what a great person he was. I mean, he played the violin for kittens. He wasn't a, a criminal, but he was treated like one. Why? Not because of racism, um, although some may debate that it may have been I don't know these officers history, so I'm not really sure if it was or wasn't. But I, I definitely believe that implicit bias based on who is in that area, who wears a ski mask coming from a convenience store. Their thought process was, oh, OK, this must be someone that fits this profile. And we it just has to stop. Like we've got to, to take the reins, like you said, mid action and think. You know, am I listening? Am I paying attention or am I just going based off of what I know to be true? We've gotten it wrong so many times now that I would think that we would take pause to ponder whether or not we're doing the right thing. Well, is that and that's what the just one idea is. And here I'm going to put this up on the screen, too. Um, thanks for putting this into the comments. And also uh, you can connect with uh, with Jen. There's a link in the description of this video or uh, in the podcast, if you're listening on the podcast. So, um, so that's what just one is all about. And I'm actually, I'm actually glad that we brought that up. Cause I, my next question is how, what is the best way that people can connect with you? If they have further questions, if they want to contribute and participate, how can they do it most effectively? Yeah. There are a number of ways that you can reach out to me. Y'all can reach out to me on social media. Um, our, our company page is JSM diversity you can also go to www.jsmdiversity.com and you, you can reach out to me that way. You can email me at hello at JSM Diversity or you guys can just send me a personal Facebook message. Like, um, I'm not tired of having these conversations yet. I feel like the past four years has been, like we talked about, just a lot of buildup and prep for this marathon that we're in right now. And I'm not going to stop having these conversations even when it's not popular because people's lives literally depend on it. They depend on the people that are doing the work that I'm doing to have conversations in de-escalated formats. And so I'm open for it. I'm all about having dialogue and having debate about the issues that are happening in our country right now. And so I'd love for you all to get in touch with me with any one of those ways. Yeah, I agree. I encourage everybody that is listening to seriously get in touch if you have questions. I mean, even if you wanna start your 30 day journey about having these conversations and you're not sure who to start them with, well, reach out to Jen, <laughs> right? It doesn't get any, any clearer than that. Um, one thing that I just wanna to touch on before we go, Jen, because I think it's an amazing story and you really wowed me with this the first time that we spoke. Tell me about your encounters with uh, Starbucks CEO or previous CEO, Howard Schultz. What happened? How did that all come about? Yeah. So um, in my my professional history, I was a retail manager for eight years with Starbucks um, off and on. And I started as a barista there and it was in South Florida. I moved to Tennessee and I got back into management uh, here in Tennessee. And it was during one time of racial unrest. It's been so many lately. Um, this was about four years ago, I guess. And I had a conversation with my store manager and who's also gone on to be uh, a human rights lawyer. So that's just amazing. But um, anyway, this was a time where I usually work in predominantly white circles. Like I've lived in the suburbs. I work in the suburbs. So it's very likely that I'm going to be the only uh, black person and uh, definitely the only black female at my job in a, in a meeting um, with other managers. It's always just been me. And so I carry that weight of, just knowing that other people may never have an opportunity to have a conversation with a black woman. And so I need to make sure that, that I am carrying myself in a certain way so that they don't judge other people. And so in doing this, when one of these incidents of lethal force being used against a black person that was detained, I don't know if it was Freddie Gray or, um, or another incident, but I think it may have been the Freddie Gray situation. Um, and so my customers were talking about this and they were, having, you know, very opinionated conversations. And as an employee, I could not speak on behalf of the company nor at work about the way that I thought or felt about it. But Starbucks 
um, traditionally was a great place for partners to interact behind closed doors and for partners to interact on how things were affecting them in society. But they were silent on this particular issue. And so I was really frustrated because I didn't have any support from my uh, fellow coworkers and I didn't have any support from my customers. And every day I'm up against this really hard conversation as a black woman and as a police officer's daughter, and there's like nowhere for me to, to, to go. And so I send an email to Howard Schultz, who was the CEO of the company at the time. Um, I just put two and two together from my own email address as a store manager. And I was like, I'm going to just see if this is his email address. So I just went in about being a partner and being black. And I, I just by gave the way, all I of these. Yeah. I didn't know that about how you just guessed on the email. You left that part out last time you told oh, me. Oh, I story. just guessed. I just <laughs> guessed. And so <laughs> if you know me well, you know that I'm the kind of person that I will email the president of the United States. Okay. Like that's just how I am. And so um, I send an email to him and I, I am unfiltered. Like I'm professional, but I'm like, Hey, listen, this is what it's like to be black and be a partner in this company right now. And it sucks. And you guys should be ashamed of yourself for not having a place where people of color who bust their butt here every day are having these really tough conversations and where we can't, you know, have anywhere to express how we really feel. And so before the, before the day was, I got an email from the secretary saying Howard Schultz wants to talk to you tomorrow. And so I start freaking out. And I told my husband, I was like, I'm going to lose my job. I just got myself in trouble. Like my mouth finally got to me. I'm going to get fired. I see, He's like, what did you do? I was like, I did this. And I said all of these things. And I was just like, man, I wish I could have taken all of it back. Like, I would love to tell you, I was just like this courageous Sojourner Truth kind of woman. No, I was like, I'm going to be out of a job with seven kids. This is going to be bad. And so um, all of the district managers were calling managers are like, what are you going to say? You're going to talk to Howard Schultz tomorrow. And so they made me nervous. And so the next day he calls at the time that he was going to call. And he and I had the best conversation that you will ever have about race. This is before allyship even became popular and people even knew what it was like Howard Schultz, man, his awareness of what was happening in the community, how black parties, what things they needed to do as a company in order to support people. It was like to another level. He listened to my ideas. He listened to the things that I had to say and for the feedback that I had given him. He was just, I mean, beyond reasonable and understandable. And even beyond that, he cared. He was very genuine in his concern. And so from that time up until the next year, I just continued to collect data of what was happening in Starbucks and different experiences that people of color had. It just it ignited a spark in me until I ended up leaving the company less than a, a year later and I started JSM Diversity. Well, just shortly after that, the Philadelphia stores incident happened and those district managers and senior representatives got information. They reached back out to me and I was able to consult and provide um, data that I had collected previously. And so I always, I always attribute Howard Schultz and that conversation that I had as the beginning and the birth of JSM diversity, because had it not been for his encouragement for me to keep doing what I was doing and his awareness that it was a problem that I was actually providing a solution for, I don't think that I would have stepped out on my own to do this business. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I just, I think that it's an amazing example. I'm, I'm so like, when you told me that I was so impressed one that you just, <laughs> you know, that you just, you just went and said, you know, screw it. I'm, I'm just going to email. I'm just going to email the CEO. Like, I, yep. I don't care who it is. I'm just going to go <laughs> for it. Like, and, uh, but then that they had the presence of mind to get back mm -hmm. to you and to hold that, that really amazing conversation, which kicked it all off. And I'm, I'm so happy that it did. And I, yep. and, I, and honestly, I just think that it's a really great way to wrap up this conversation that you and I are having, because if you're listening now, all it takes is one conversation to start things off, right? one chance, one conversation to really start to change things. And I encourage everybody to, you know, to have those conversations a little bit more often. So Jen, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. It has been amazing. And hopefully something that was said or done will provide a little insight on this very sticky area. We hope that you all would engage in these conversations in safe places with safe people 
and that you are unfiltered. Like ask the real questions that you really want to get answered, whether the hair is done a certain way or why there is black on black crime. Like whatever you want to know, um, you won't ever be able to fully embrace a movement or embrace a struggle unless you understand it. And in order for you to understand it better, you've got to ask questions. I totally agree. I'm so, you know, honestly, I'm, I'm very proud about what you're doing, the kind of things that JSM Diversity is doing. I'm proud to have you on the show. And I, uh, I think those are really wise words. So thanks again for being on the show. Thank you guys for tuning in. Everybody's saying, I learned so much from this interview. Amber's comment is so big. I'm afraid if I put it up, it's going to take all of the screen up. <laughs> this is amazing. Learn so much from this interview. Sterling says, uh, you're such an inspiring and hopeful light, Jen. Thank you for being you. Um, Karen says that this is a great interview. It just takes one conversation. I 100% agree. So Jen, thanks again so much. Uh, this, this has been great. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, you guys. Bye. All right, this is Jen and Josh signing off for another episode of Fire Builders Live. Guys, join us again. We stream Monday through Saturday every day at 12 p.m. So we'll see you next time. Adios. Peace.